If you had an N64 in the late 90s, you probably had... GoldenEye 007. It's the 15th anniversary of its release, so... What the? Let's do this. Now for this review, I'm running the real deal. Low res graphics, squeaky analog stick, and all. Just like the movies, this game starts by shooting you in the face. Released on August 25th, 1997, GoldenEye 007 for the Nintendo 64 is now as ancient as it is influential. These days, high-tech AAA games like Battlefield and Call of Duty carry the torch that GoldenEye once helped light. This was the state of the art, the top of the line for the time, and it defined what console-based shooters could be. In 1997, Doom was about four years old, a patriarch of the genre. Duke Nukem 3D and Quake had just come out a year before, each carving their own unique innovations in the industry. Games favoring full 3D environments, characters, and objects instead of pre-rendered sprites were in their infancy. The N64 was young, popular, and powerful in the console gaming world. Turok Dinosaur Hunter had released earlier in 1997 and was praised as a technically impressive shooter and adventure game. This was truly a golden age of game design where a team of less than 10 Rareware employees could create such an influential piece of software. GoldenEye was conceived as a very different game. First as a side-scrolling shooter for the Super Nintendo, but then the project was moved to Nintendo's next-gen system and was reimagined as an on-rail shooter like Virtual Cop before it finally settled on the free-roaming first-person model. It was noted as having an unimpressive showing at E3 97, but when GoldenEye 007 finally released on August 25th, almost two years after the movie, everyone wanted it. This friggin' piece of plastic and metal eventually sold 8 million copies, becoming the third best-selling N64 game ever, and notably the best-selling N64 game not developed by Nintendo, the first two being Mario 64 and Mario Kart 64. Now, I'm a huge fan of the movie. It's probably my favorite Bond film, but it's definitely Brosnan's best. Beg your pardon? Forgot to knock. The GoldenEye 007 development team spent a lot of time looking at production stills for the film and even visiting the sets while the film was being shot in order to help design the 20 levels that would be in the game. The story in the game was tweaked a bit so that they could put the player into all these great movie set pieces, even if Bond didn't actually appear in those scenes. Bungee jumping, 006 getting capped by Ormov, the St. Petersburg tank rampage, the antenna cradle battle, it's all there. They even included Boris being a jerk. Designer Martin Hollis notes that the maps were built by the level designers without forethought as to player start and finish points. They were simply built to be interesting spaces and filled in with enemies and objects later. It's probably for this reason that the game seems somewhat non-linear. Sometimes you'll come across a corner of a level that has no real reason to exist. Professional reviewers often cited the game's objective-focused gameplay as a selling point because it set it apart from games like Doom where all you do is black bad guys and collect keys, but I always thought that was kind of a lame assessment. Yeah, the objectives are cool and they add a certain feeling of authenticity to the game, but objectives weren't anything new in first-person shooters. Star Wars Dark Forces, which released in 95 for the PC and later for the PlayStation, 
was another first-person shooter with objectives. I've always thought of this as a harshly underrated game. It's really fun, but not because you get put to work running around completing tasks. The quality of a game is way more complicated than that. In Dark Forces, you could probably go through the entire game not even thinking about objectives because they were just incidental waypoints along a relatively linear path. Instead of being tedious, though, they were simple and effective catalysts to the story. This is too easy. Now I get to my ship. Besides, some of the objectives in Goldeneye were just downright confusing. I mean, it would have taken me forever to figure some of them out if I hadn't consulted a friend or a guidebook or something. I mean, how am I supposed to know that you're supposed to put a modem on this terminal? This computer in the surface, you're supposed to blow it up, you're supposed to turn it off, it just says power it down, I don't know, you know. So I'm supposed to analyze the key, okay, with the key analyzer, so... What do I, okay, I guess I hit the trigger when I have this thing and I pick up the key. Telemetric data. All right, I'll look for that. In my opinion, GoldenEye's fluid controls contribute heavily to making it insanely fun and replayable. Guns fire and recoil in a way that just feels right. Running and strafing feels physical instead of just mathematical. There's a certain amount of inertia and slight randomness to the movement, and feedback to the player just made it easier to play. You could always tell when you scored a hit on a character from the thud sound accompanied by a spark and a puff of smoke. Being a kid in the 90s who had played a poop load of Doom at my best friend's house, I recognized a series of gameplay and graphical innovations that, while not always unique to the game, were at least the best implementations of such mechanics to date, in my opinion, and are things that you probably wouldn't even think twice about today. Enemies are fully textured polygonal models with location-specific damage modeling, which is both varied and precise. This means that enemies take damage and react differently depending on where they get hit, and hit detection is spot on in this game. You can even hit enemies' guns and hats, which was pretty cool at the time, although it can mess you up too. Ah, come on! Die, man! At the end of the mission, you get to tally up all those hits and see how you did. If you've ever wondered what other means, well, that's when you shoot people's guns and their hats. Next on the list of innovations are explosions. This game did them awesomely. In fact, it did them so well that just about everything could be destroyed. Like this. Or this. See this? Oh yeah, it's just a little model I've been working on in my spare time. Yeah, BOOM! I don't think it was until Max Payne that we saw such consistent environmental destructibility in a game. It seems simple, but this was the first game I remember that actually let you shoot a lock to open a door. Motion captured animations combined with clever enemy AI made the enemies seem way more realistic than other games at the time. They seemed super intelligent at times. How did he freaking know how to do that? And at times, really dumb. I mean, look at this guy. And it wasn't just enemies that appeared intelligent for the time. Natalia wasn't always just an objective to save or protect. In the jungle, she laid down the law. Also on the topic of non-player AI, what's up with the scientists in this game? Don't accidentally catch them in the crossfire because you will pay. Russian scientists apparently don't frack around. The draw distance in this game was incredible for the time. After having trudged through the pea soup fog in Turok, which came out earlier in 97, gamers like me were blown away when we got the chance to basically snipe guards from as much as 300 meters away or more. It blew my brain. And that was just the first level. 
of course, the multiplayer. There's no denying that the multiplayer in GoldenEye was insanely popular. There was nothing more fun than crowding around the N64 with three of your friends. Amazingly, director Martin Hollis admits that multiplayer GoldenEye was an afterthought. The game didn't have any kind of multiplayer until just months before its release. Astonishingly, developer Steve Ellis is pretty much solely responsible for throwing the entire game mode together in that time. If you see him, thank this man. In any case, I'd wager most people spent more time in here than in a single player game. Multiplayer wasn't new in games, but the N64 marketed the poop out of the fact that it supported up to four players right out of the box. So split screen games like Star Fox and GoldenEye were big. Gentlemen, welcome to versus mode! Up to four players at once! See that? Each player has his own quadrant on the screen. In GoldenEye you could pick from tons of characters and play a good variety of purpose-built multiplayer maps or conversions from the main game. To this day, I still refer to kills in games as kill counts. One of my favorite innovations were the grenades. You can pull the pin and let them cook, and the physicality of tossing them and seeing them bounce around still seems very intuitive. However, even with the countless hours I've put into this game, I still haven't figured out like when and why enemies decide to use grenades. You'll just be working your way through a level when suddenly... No warning, no on-screen nade indicator, nothing like that. You just get a maybe a tink-tink sound, but that's about it. Enemy grenade tosses happen somewhat predictably in places where groups of enemies have been programmed to camp behind cover, like in the jungle or the control levels. But sometimes it happens completely at random. And remember that precise damage modeling and hit detection? Well, grenades are one of those others on your post-mission stat screen. It's one of those things that still has me lolling every time it happens. Even the weapons themselves are innovative. Not in the sense that they're somehow special weapons, but in the general way that they're presented. They're polygonal, texture-mapped objects and fully animated. Slides on pistols slide back, shells eject, and if you listen closely enough, you can hear the cartridges hit the floor. Weapons have limited magazines that need to be reloaded regularly. This hadn't been done in many games to date. Hitting R brings up a sight that you can aim with, and while in this mode, you can't move, but you can crouch and lean right or left. Besides this, player weapons leave bullet holes that are material specific. Wood, metal, stone, glass, each surface makes a distinct sound and decal. There was so much detail and complexity in the game that there was always an element of unpredictability. You never played it the same way twice, and you always had a reason to come back and have a new experience. Now I know we keep going on about how GoldenEye is this perfect game, but it did have its share of bugs and, let's just say, uh, unusual programming compromises. Rather than being annoying though, in some cases I came to really enjoy some of these more uh, rough edges of GoldenEye. Speed strafing refers to a mathematical error that occurs when you both strafe with the C button and run with the stick pushed that enables you to run slightly faster than just using one or the other. Something about the game adding your vectors together? I don't know. In any case, it gives you about a 40% speed increase if you do it right. A GoldenEye noob might contest this, but I've conducted races in multiplayer, and trust me, it's, it's a thing. There were a couple of strange enemy AI programming decisions that worked well enough in GoldenEye, but they'd never be accepted in today's games. For instance, in many levels, if an alarm went off, it could start infinite guards pouring into the map. Oh wait, well, I mean Call of Duty does that too, okay, well I guess that's a bad example. The things enemies couldn't see or shoot through seemed odd sometimes. Glass, railings, and other barriers appeared like opaque walls to the enemies, so they never try to shoot through or across them, even when you're right there. 
it's a strange rule, but it does make things a lot easier, which is a good thing, because this game is already pretty challenging. The stealth mechanics work really well for the most part, but the fact that you can get away with popping off single shots from an AK without alerting anyone doesn't really make sense. Good to know, though! On a similar note, play the game enough and you'll realize that enemies can't shoot you if you're right next to them. It's like they put their guns right through you and then shoot through your body but on the other side of it. Realistic? No. Helpful? Yeah. The door mechanics in GoldenEye take some getting used to, uh, specifically doors that swing open. Alright, what the heck man. Open, not close. Open. Now once you realize that you can close doors as well as open them, you'll dominate multiplayer games in the facility and the archives by closing doors behind you and tripping up players that aren't as familiar with them. Possibly GoldenEye's biggest flaw is its frame rate. Being more of a PC gamer these days, I've grown accustomed to high resolutions and a silky smooth 45 to 60 frames per second. GoldenEye often drops not just below 30, but below 20 frames per second, and in extreme cases, like four-player matches and in cases where there are a lot of explosions or smoke effects on the screen, it can chug along even slower. I guess it's the price you pay for greatness on the N64. This game is packed with easter eggs. Possibly the most tantalizing easter egg is this island on the first level that can only be accessed using cheats. It was initially planned as a separate objective. I guess Bond was going to take a boat over there or something. One of the coolest tricks people figured out was mixing and matching double weapons. Basically, equip a set of double weapons. Reload the left gun while switching weapons by hitting A several times. If you time it right and mismatch weapons pop up in the interim, you can pull the trigger to set them in place. Check it out at Destave with a scope. I only know about these from wasting so much time combing through the facility when I was a kid. I wonder what scientists put those up there. Maybe it's not technically an easter egg, but here's one in the second bunker that I think a lot of people probably know about. Use your magnet close enough to this grade and, aha, throwing knives. Perfect for double O when you really need to be quiet. <laughs> and while I'm here, here's another one for those paying attention. In the silo, there's a segment where you shoot at Oromov down a hallway. If you're good enough, or you cheat, you can hurt him enough that he drops his briefcase. If you kill him, which I think you have to cheat to do, then he'll drop a briefcase and a key. Neither one does anything, but I guess it's just another example of an objective from an early version of the game that was removed. This guy. <laughs> it's funny because it's, it's me. You know, no me's allowed. K kind of funny. Shoot enough boxes in the caverns and you might find these. Dual assault rifles. If you're playing the train, you can find secret weapons in this particular crate. There's an RCP-90 if you're playing on Agent, and a Destave on Secret Agent, but nothing for double O's. If you've earned the All Weapons sheet, you have access to a lot of really weird weapons that you don't find anywhere in the main game. Hunting knives? I don't remember those. Whoa, weird shotgun. Wait, you can use the tank gun? What, do you shoot it out of your face or something? One of the coolest unexpected features is that you can actually dramatically affect what goes down in a cinema sequence. The sky's the limit when you've got a grenade. You know, the trouble with video games is that after a while, the next one comes along and the old one eventually dies. After Perfect Dark came out and the N64 was slowly forgotten as the next generation of consoles came out, I thought this was the case with GoldenEye. Just a few years later, however, I found out about all kinds of online communities that have been keeping the game on life support all these years. All kinds of mods and conversions of the game have been invented by the rabid fans out there. 
GoldenEye Doom is a total conversion for the PC game Doom that replaces sound effects, graphics, levels, pretty much everything to be like GoldenEye. Why? I'm not really sure, but this is pretty cool, right? GoldenEye Source is a modification for Half-Life 2 that's been in development for years. Weapons and levels especially look really good in this mod. So different, yet so similar. One of the coolest mods I've heard of is GoldenEye Online. It's less of a mod and more of a hacked emulation, but somehow people way smarter than me figured out how to run the GoldenEye ROM in an emulator and play deathmatches with other people online. This just blew my mind when I heard about it. Don't like playing GoldenEye with a keyboard and a mouse? Pick up one of these and plug your N64 controller right into your computer. There are several others too. There's a perfect dark into GoldenEye conversion called GoldenEye X. There's a conversion called Goldfinger64. You can even find user-made levels that you can play if you're using an emulator. It's really amazing how robust this online community is. Well, I guess that's about it for my GoldenEye 007 retrospective review. Happy 15th birthday, GoldenEye. Hey guys, thanks for watching my review of GoldenEye 007 for the Nintendo 64. I wanted to talk more about follow-ups to the game, and specifically the remake that came out in 2010, but I just couldn't fit it all in, so I'm making a follow-up video. Stay tuned in the coming weeks for that, and subscribe to my channel to be notified when it's posted.